Threat congestion is a phenomenon which can occur if multiple threads are trying to access the same blocking data structure at the same time. If you look at this diagram here, you can see that we have a producing thread here, which is producing elements and inserting them into this blocking queue. We also have three consuming threads, which are consuming elements from this blocking queue. If two or more threads are trying to access this blocking queue at the exact same time, then one of the threads will be allowed to access the blocking queue and the other threads will be blocked. The blocked threads are queued up and they await that the blocking data structure becomes available again, meaning that the threat that has access to it um, relinquishes that access. In this diagram, you can see that the consuming threads here will uh, get queued up um, when they try to access the blocking queue in case the producing threat has access to it. In reality, even the producing thread here could be queued up in the same queue, uh, waiting to get access to the blocking queue in case some of the consuming threads here are accessing it at the same time. It is the queuing up of threads waiting to access the shared blocking data structure that we refer to as threat congestion. The more threads that are queued up, the higher the level of the congestion. While a thread is blocked, queued up waiting to access the blocking data structure, that thread cannot make any progress on any task. It is just wasting potential execution time. So the more threads that are waiting here in order to access the same shared data structure, the longer time each thread has to wait until it gets um, access to the data structure and can continue executing. So all this waiting time here uh, leads to wasted execution time. One way to alleviate threat congestion is, if possible, to give each of the consuming threats their own data structure. This is not always possible, but sometimes it is. In this case here, the producing threat will divide its produced elements among three different blocking queues, and then have each consuming threat here only take elements from one of these queues. That way, only two threads will ever be trying to access the same blocking queue at a time. The producing threat and one consuming threat. Obviously, such a solution can lead to a situation where one thread has consumed all its elements and is thus blocked waiting for new elements to be inserted into its queue, while there are still elements queued up in the queues of the other threads. This situation wastes execution time of this thread here. One way to solve that is or could be to allow a thread to steal work, steal elements from the other thread's queues only in the situation when its own queue is empty. This technique is known as work stealing and is used among other in among other places in the fork and join pool built into to the Java concurrency utility libraries. Now let's have a look at a code example. Let me just scroll up so you can see the beginning of the class. As you can see here in the beginning of this main method, first we create a variable that holds the number of elements to produce by the producing thread. Then the example here creates the shared blocking queue and makes sure that it has space enough uh, and the capacity to hold all of these um, objects to produce in case none of the consuming threads reach to could take any elements from the queue before the producing thread has produced all of the 1 million elements. I'm just making sure that it has enough space. Then here, I can, uh, the example uh, creates um, an array of three consumer runnables and the consumer runnables are, uh, contains the code 
that consumes from the blocking queue. Then we have a synchronized block here. I have that just to make sure, you know, that these threads that I'm creating in here, or that the example is creating in here, can actually see this uh, blocking queue that I created up here. This is so this synchronized block is for thread visibility reasons. And um, if you don't know why that is, I have explained that in my videos about um, the um, Java memory model, the Java um, happens before guarantee videos, and the video about the Java synchronized uh, keyword and the Java volatile keyword. I am also touching on thread visibility issues, so you can watch those videos to learn more about that. Then inside of the synchronized block here, um, the code example contains a for loop, and it will um, loop one time for each uh, element in this array, which is three times, and can create a new consumer runnable, passing the blocking queue to its constructor here. Then the example creates a new thread and passes the newly created consumer runnable to the thread to, uh, for execution and then starts the thread. Then the example here creates the producing thread. And as you can see, it creates a single, a simple runnable here um, as a lambda expression. And um, as you can see here, it uses a for loop in order to produce all the objects that um, I have initialized up here that we want the producer to, um, to create. So it will loop one million times in this case here, and it will put a string with a value of the counter here into the blocking queue. It doesn't really matter what this element is in this case. Um, we only care that it is inserted and that it is consumed, removed from the blocking queue by the consumer threads. Then the example prints out here that all the objects have been produced. Um, actually, this thread does that, and then um, it uh, writes out how many objects it has produced. And then it enters a synchronized um, um, block again, and then it calls the stop method on each of these consumer runnables here. And then it starts the producing thread up, so all of this code starts running. Now let's have a look at the consumer runnable class. As you can see, it implements the runnable interface so that we can pass it to a thread for execution. Then it has a blocking queue, and that is the queue from where it will uh, consume its elements. Then it has this atomic boolean here, uh, which starts with a value of true and which signals to this um, consumer runnable whether it should continue running or whether it should, it should initiate its um, shutdown process. Then it has a constructor through which we can pass the blocking queue to the uh, consumer runnable that it should consume elements from. And then it has a stop method. And the stop method, uh, the only thing it does is flip the value of this uh, atomic boolean from true, its initial value, to false. And then we have the run method where uh, the uh, majority or the main part of the, of the code is executed. The run method first prints out the name of the consumer thread and, uh, you know, that it has started. Then it starts consuming objects and it keeps uh, executing this while loop here as long as this keep running here has the value of true, this atomic boolean. And the get method returns the value of this atomic boolean, so as long as this returns true, this loop here continues running. The take object from queue method here um, attempts to take a single object from the queue. And if um, the queue doesn't have any elements, it will return null. Thus, uh, this if statement here will check if the object is not null. And if it is not, we will increment the number of objects consumed. Now, at, at some point, the producing thread will call the stop method up here and flip the value of keep running to false. At that time, 
the consumer thread will exit this loop and continue down here. And first it will write out, print out that it is finishing up. And then what it will do is it will continue to take elements from the queue as long as the queue has elements in it. And again, as uh, for every time it successfully um, takes an object from the queue, it will increment this counter here. And then it will end up printing out the name of the thread again and that it has finished and how many objects it consumed. And as you can see here, the take object from queue method simply uh, returns blocking queue poll, um, which will block for a maximum of 1000 milliseconds milliseconds because of the time unit passed here uh, for an uh, element to become available inside the blocking queue and if an element is available within the 1000 milliseconds that element will be returned from the poll method and if not then null will be returned and that null will then be returned back up here and here so that's really it now let's try to run this first code example and see what it prints out. Now, as you can see, first the three consumer threads are started up and then they're waiting because they're trying to take something from the blocking queue, but it's still empty. Then the producing thread is start, has started up and it finishes here and it has produced 1 million elements. After that, it has uh, st it stops the three or it sends the stop signal to the three consumer threads. The consumer threads do not actually stop immediately when they receive this stop signal, as you saw in the code. So they are consuming, consuming, and then they will finish up eating, uh, consuming whatever is left in in the blocking queue. And then you can see here they are finishing up. That uh, is printed out when they receive the um, the stop signal. And down here you can see the number of elements that each thread was able to consume from the blocking queue. And if you add these three numbers up, they will add up to 1 million. You can do that yourself if you want to see that it is true. Now let's have a look at the second example where each of the consuming threads gets their own blocking queue to consume elements from. See, the main difference here from the first example here to this example is that here we create a single shared blocking queue but in this example here we create an array of blocking queues and then we put three uh, blocking queues into them and then you can see down here where the consumer runnables are created that instead of the single shared blocking queue um, being passed in the consumer runnable constructor we pass now each of the three uh, created blocking queues up here. So now each of the consuming threads has its own blocking queue to consume elements from. Similarly, when the producing thread here is producing elements, it has to produce it not into a single shared blocking queue, but into each of these uh, blocking queues uh, found in the blocking queues um, array. And the way we decide which um, blocking queue to insert it into is simply by taking the modulo of the index here and the index goes from zero to the number of objects to produce and then we take that um, and uh, i the index here and no oh, sorry divide that by the length of the blocking queues and the remainder of that division is the index of the blocking queue that we call put on here. This will divide the produced elements evenly among the, uh, the three blocking queues, but obviously as we're producing um, one million elements and, el and one million is not divisibly, divisible evenly between, uh, you know, um, by three, that means that one of these uh, blocking queues will get one element more than the other two. Now let's try to run this example and see what it prints out. Now, as you can see, it starts out in the same way. It starts the threads, produces the 1 million objects, and then it sends the stop signal to each of the consuming threads. And each of the consuming threads then says, okay, we will finish up. And then eventually they have consumed all the elements in their blocking queue. And then they print out the number of elements that they have consumed each. And as you can see here, 
they have you know, consumed almost the same amount. And again, as you can see, the elements have been divided uh, evenly among the, the blocking queues, except for this one, which got one element more. Uh, and if you add up these three numbers, they will also add up to one million. Detecting threat congestion can be a bit tricky because this queuing up of the threats here is actually happening inside of the Java virtual machine, so it is not directly visible to you in your code. One way to detect it is to use a, a profiler which can tell you how much time each of these consuming threats and also the producing threat spends being blocked, being idle. Another solution is to simply uh, try this, um, try and see how much you can push through this uh, system here with different number of consuming threads. So measuring the throughput of the system. So you start out with one producing thread and one consuming thread, and then you see how fast you can, you can push, for instance, 1 million or 10 million or 1 billion elements through the system. Then you increase with one another thread, you measure the time again, and you increase with another thread, and then you measure the time again. Now in the beginning, you will probably see that the time it takes to um, produce or to process all the elements will go down. And at some point when you're adding more threads, the, um, the time no longer starts going down, it will stagnate. And at some point it might even go a little bit up again. And that is because the threads are now starting to waste a lot of time being blocked in the queue rather than actually executing, uh, processing the elements here. So that is another way to kind of uh, find out how many consuming threats you should have or whether you have a threat uh, congestion issue in general and whether you should switch to uh, some kind of solution that does something about it. Like for instance, such a solution here. That's all for this video about threat congestion in Java. Remember to check out the description below the video for a, a links to a textual version of this tutorial as well as links to other related tutorials. And if you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you want to watch more videos like this, you are very welcome to subscribe to my channel.